And now we'll talk about disaster recovery, otherwise known as DR. This is really about dealing with a whole data center outage. Now, if a data center goes out, you might want your service to be served from a different data center than before. Now, dealing with the code aspect of this, if you're writing stateless services, that's really easy. All you need to do is deploy your code into this data center and this other data center so it's running in two data centers around the globe, and then the code can be up and running, usually in very short order, and we can get your service up quickly. But handling your data across data centers is really the hard part of the, of the story. And the problem, of course, is that if all your data is in one data center and the data center goes down, your data is not in the other data center. And the data is constantly changing, whereas the code is mostly immutable. So you typically want to replicate your data across multiple data centers. Um, but the problem with that is when you're replicating data across data centers, there's high latency. It takes about 133 milliseconds for data to go halfway around the Earth uh, and as a round trip, right? You want to send the, and then you want to get an acknowledgement back, right? And this is really best case scenario. And if you're doing lots of data updates, then you're making constant trips halfway around the globe and back in order to update the data. So the best way to deal with disaster recovery is to use a storage service that does this replication for you. And it will typically batch up the changes uh, and so every maybe five minutes or so, it'll take a batch and send it to the other data center, which means, of course, that you have an RTO of five minutes, if it's doing that, where you could have lost about five minutes worth of data should the, some changes happen, and before five minutes, that data center goes out, then the data doesn't get sent to the other uh, uh, data center. Right? Uh, so the you can create similar clusters in different geographical regions. And when data changes in a cluster, replicate it to the other cluster. Um, ideally, you're using a data storage service that will do this for you. Again, it will usually batch those changes together and replicate it periodically. And as I mentioned, the delay is the RPO as the first cluster could die when sending the next batch. The more clusters you have, because you might even want to do more than two clusters, right? You might want to have three, four, five clusters around the globe, then the more resilient your service is going to be, the, because you can have more data center outages and still be able to start, um, you know, handle client requests. Right? But of course, the more expensive it's going to be because you're going to have your service running in multiple data centers simultaneously. And the slower it's going to be to run the service on an ongoing basis because you're going to have to replicate to all of those uh, regions any data changes that are happening. So once again, you know, the Earth is a single point of failure here. Uh, and so there's no, nothing you can do to completely protect yourself from this, right? So accept that, do the best you're willing to from a business perspective and a cost analysis perspective, and then be happy with that. Um, and then a little tongue in cheek at the bottom here, you know, someday when we get data centers on the moon, and then you can be able to replicate to the moon, the best latency is about two and a half to 2.6 seconds to the moon and back uh, to do each data replication. So the performance will really go down, but you'll have much higher resiliency. But we'll worry about that sometime in the future. There's a couple of different architectures that people use today for doing disaster recovery. There's an active passive architecture, which I'll show on this slide, and then there's an active active architecture, which I'll show on the next slide. So let's do active passive first. With an active passive architecture, data center A over here, which is the active one, it's going to take all the traffic. So internet traffic gets directed to data center A. And then periodically, it replicates those data changes over to the passive data center. In my example here, that's data center B. Now in this case, data center A is handling all the traffic spikes. So if there's any traffic spike that happens to happen to your service, then data center A has to deal with that because data center B isn't getting any of the live internet traffic at all. Um, what you have running in data center B is really wasted capacity, right? You have machines in here that are ready to go should disaster recovery occur, but they're not really doing very much. They're just at the ready should a disaster recovery happen. The code deployment is, of course, easy into both data centers. Uh, failover is infrequently tested. I mean, what's the likelihood you're going to actually test this scenario and force a failover to occur? 
for some cloud providers, they won't even talk to you. If you say to them, to your cloud provider, please shut off my service as if you had a disaster recovery so I can see if traffic goes to the other data center, they'll be like, we're not doing that for you, <laughs> right? That's a too major a thing. So this ends up being a very difficult thing to test, and it frequently goes untested. And of course, should a disaster um, scenario occur, you're now left you know, hoping for the best, and if it doesn't work, you're really left scrambling. And you may have paid a lot of money for this, and development for this, and then it just isn't working for you. Um, also, the administrator decides when to do the failover, and that the administrator may be your cloud provider who does this, and manually initiates this change. So that's the active-passive architecture. Another architecture, oh, here I was, um, in the animated slide, here I flipped over to make the data center B now become the active one. Um, I highlighted it, but I didn't change the word here. And so now traffic's being routed to it, and then it can try to replicate traffic to data center A, which may be offline, so it may not be accepting those replicas, uh, that replica traffic, so be aware of that. So now you're down to possibly one data center, right? If two data centers go down in this scenario, then you're hosed and you can't do anything. All right, now let's talk about the active, active architecture. In this architecture here, we have data centers A and B, and they're both active, which means they're both willing to accept traffic from the internet. So some internet traffic goes to A, some internet traffic goes to B. Um, so that means that both data centers are able to handle the spikes that are occurring. Oh, and I forgot to mention this. And then, of course, what's happening in A will periodically replicate to B, and what happens in B will periodically replicate to A. Both data centers are handling the spikes in the traffic. So that means you can really are running them both with, you could run them both with less capacity, so it's cheaper to run them in the aggregate, and there's less wasted space. So it's a more efficient way of running the service. With this model, you're also continuously testing it because some traffic's going to A, some traffic's going to B. You always know that both these denisators are up and working correctly. The only thing you would have to test is if one goes down, all traffic goes to the other data center. Um, but other than that, you know everything is functioning well. Now the development is a little bit harder uh, from a software development perspective because you may have data inconsistencies now. Some requests might go to data center B and update some data, and then there's a lag before that gets replicated to A. If during that lag time, a request comes into data center A to go and read some data, the change may not be there yet. And so you might re be returning stale data back to the caller because you're waiting for the replication to actually occur. So one way that you can mitigate this is something that I mentioned earlier in the course when we talked about eventual consistency patterns where a caller might come into A, and A could check its data to see what information it has. It could also make a call across to B to see what information it has. And if the two pieces of information are not the same, it could possibly look at which one has the later timestamp on it and return that one back to the caller. Um, now, with what I just said, you have to be aware, though, about using timestamps because the machines in here might have some differences in the clock compared to the machines in here. So if the timestamp difference is very wide, then it's very likely that the later timestamp is correct. If the timestamp differences are very close to each other, then you can't really tell if the piece of data with the earlier timestamp might actually be the later piece of data. So just be aware that clock skew does cause an issue for these kinds of scenarios. And failover in this case is actually very fast, and it's very automatic because really both data centers are active the whole time. So you're always testing this and everything is always you know, supported on either side of the data centers for getting any traffic in. And that is it. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this class on distributed cloud applications. We covered a lot of material in here, um, but I think it's a really a lot of good stuff that's really applicable and in a, presented in a technology agnostic way so that you can use it with uh, any cloud provider and any set of services or databases that you come in contact with.